All righty, let's uh, get started here. As I have said many times before, if we don't start, we can't finish. So we probably need to get started. Weather forecast for today. <laughs> rain <laughs> and more rain. Uh, lightning. It's been a long time since I've seen this much lightning. And uh, the thunder just rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls. But we needed the rain, and I'm thankful for that. I understand South Georgia's gotten a, a, a too much rain, and they're having some flooding down there. I don't know exactly where. Uh, my brother lived just south of Cordell, and yesterday they had uh, two-inch size hail. Uh, he texted me this morning. He says both his vehicles have hail damage. And uh, I saw some of the pictures, not that he sent, but that someone sent from down in Chris County. And uh, I've never seen hail like that. Usually hail is in like ball shapes and stuff like that. This looked like those, y'all know those little chocolate and pecan candies they call turtles? That's what it looked like, like kind of star-shaped stuff. Really weird looking. But, uh, and I think they were, they were posted on Facebook, I think. But... Uh, Anyway, it's been some rough weather, and uh, I think there's more coming tomorrow. All righty, by way of announcements, uh, in the morning at 9.30, the Legacy Builders will be leaving the parking lot, headed to Juliet, 
If you have signed up for that trip, be sure you are here and loaded on the bus at 9.30 because at 9.30 we roll. So looking forward. We're supposed to be there uh, at 11. Uh, we'll be eating first when we get there. Uh, that's the arrangement set up with the whistle stop. And we'll be getting, uh, we'll get there hopefully a few minutes ahead of time. But we'll be uh, some of the first seated. We have reservation for that. Then after we eat, <coughs> which should be somewhere by noon anyway, uh, weather permitting, we will take a look at some of the little shops and stuff that are there. And then we'll come back home, hope to be home no later than around 3 o'clock uh, tomorrow afternoon. So if you have signed up for that trip, we look forward to seeing you in the morning. And other announcements. Sunday. Regular scheduled services are at least our summertime schedule <coughs> on Sunday morning. Uh, but on Sunday evening, there are no services because it is Father's Day. And <coughs> there will be no activities for children or uh, adults or anything uh, Sunday afternoon. And that <coughs> is all the announcements that I have, unless you have some. And I assume you don't either. So, <clears throat> with that said, we'll go to the front page of our prayer guide. <clears throat> let, me give you <clears throat> let me give you one to add that is not on our prayer list. Found out about it this afternoon about 4, 4.30. Frances Lucas had a stroke. She was airlifted to Savannah Memorial and uh, they are running some tests on her. But pending the outcome of those tests, it is possible that she will be coming home tomorrow or uh, Friday, depending on those test outcomes. So uh, pray for this family. Uh, fortunately, it was not uh, Someone described it as a small stroke. I'm not, I'm not sure about that word, small stroke. <laughs> to me, a stroke is, is, is pretty serious. That's like a light heart attack. And I understand what they're saying. But the, uh, yeah, no, it's not, it just wasn't that. <laughs> no, it's all, it's serious stuff. At least to me, in my mind, it is. So anyway, moving down to our church family tests and procedures, and you see the names of those that have pending procedures that we are aware of. And then, of course, continue to pray for uh, Bob Sawyer's family. I had his service yesterday afternoon out in Roddy, us and about a million gnats uh, were there. <coughs> Under our church family needs, uh, continue to pray for uh, all of those that are listed there with various needs, some of you may be aware of, some you may not be, uh, some we're not even aware of, but uh, do pray for each of those people that are there and the various needs that they have. Mr. Wilburn Holland's been having some falls recently. Need to uh, pray for him especially and for uh, his family, for uh, Ricky and Wanda as they uh, provide care for him. Any updates that you have on any of these that are on our church family list? Or any that we need to add? Okay, we'll go to our extended family. And again, you see the names of those that are there. I don't have any real highlights or updates on any of those other than what we've uh, shared with you in the, in the recent past. Do you have any updates on any of these? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Jordan Smith yes. passed away yesterday. Yes, I did see that. Jordan Smith.
Yes. You can uh, take Jane Oliver off, and she's doing really good after the hip surgery. She's extremely active. She's doing about two months now. Okay. We always like taking people off because they're doing better. Yes. We'll take them off if they die, but we'd rather take them off if they're getting better. Yes. <laughs> That's good, good news. Going back to Jordan Smith, is he the, the man that had the radiator shop out? Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, any other updates on any of these on our community, uh, extended family? Okay, we'll move over then to our back page. And again, you see the folks that are at home, senior living facility, uh, Bryant, Royal Care, Kingsford Place, and Southern Pines and other uh, facilities in the area. Continue to pray for them, as well as the staff and the caregivers of those places. Uh, any updates that you have that you would share with us on any of those? Already under our special prayer needs, uh, you'll see those listed there. I would highlight one down at the very bottom, uh, the Hutchins family. I was in touch with them earlier today, and they said they drove through some very, very rough weather, rain and wind and stuff. Uh, have not heard from them the rest of the day, so I'm assuming everything is, is doing well. They're on their way out to Fort Worth for the National Bible Drill competition that Leela's going to be in representing the state of Georgia, as well as uh, uh, our church. Hey, Beth, are you going? <laughs> you fly out tomorrow. Bet your arms will be tired. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> David, you're going to be in trouble with that mark, boy. Especially for arms getting tired. Uh, Anyway, do pray for that family, uh, and they are very appreciative of uh, the financial help that uh, many of you were a part of through your Sunday school class or individually, whatever it may have been. So on behalf of that family, I say thank you uh, for them. And of course, uh, you see all of the other needs that are there, those that uh, are in military, several facilities mentioned there. And also, on the other side, uh, our missionaries, the Southern Baptist Convention has been meeting in New Orleans this week. And I've forgotten now the number, but they com commissioned a whole nother group of missionaries that are going out. Uh, and I saw one post on there. Uh, they had this, this couple uh, silhouetted behind the screen. Uh, you could not see them because of... Uh, security reasons because of where they are going which did not even get mentioned and so uh, just just remember we've got missionaries serving in some very dangerous places not only have they left the the comforts of of home and family here but they are serving in places uh, where it is quite dangerous and you can be killed there just because you are a christian and if you are caught uh, sharing the gospel with someone, you can be executed. No trial, just, you know, executions. So do pray for our missionaries. <clears throat> Any other prayer concerns, prayer needs that we need to mention? I do know we have children's camp coming up this summer. We've got uh, youth camp coming up. In, that's next week, isn't it? Youth camp, is that next week? They're going one day. When? 23rd? Okay. So be praying for them. Pray for Ryan. Pray for Jamie uh, as they make prepper. Jamie. <laughs> Poor Jamie's office looks like a convenience store. Um, he's got... In fact, he's probably got more groceries than some convenience stores have. But uh, they're getting ready for that, so be sure you pray for them. All righty. Anything else? All right, let's do pray for the safety of those that are in the path of uh, 
this weather that the weather will only be rain uh, and no tornadoes or, or high wind damage. All right, join me as we pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for every extension and expression of your love towards us. Uh, thank you, first and foremost, that you demonstrated your love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a, what a great demonstration of love. You didn't only say you loved us, you proved it by offering your son to die in our place to pay our sin debt and our sin penalty. So we say thank you for that. We do thank you for the rain. We pray, God, that uh, those that have been in the path of more severe weather uh, have not suffered greatly. I know some have been inconvenienced because of power outages and maybe fallen limbs and things of this nature, but God, we just pray there's been no real property damage or uh, more than that, no <coughs> loss of life or injuries. And we thank you, Father, for those linemen that work for the various power companies that go out and, and make repairs on downed power lines. Uh, they are our heroes, and we thank you for them and for their service and for their work on our behalf. Father, we thank you for our church. We thank you for uh, its ministry here in this community. Uh, we are blessed in so many different ways, and you have given us You've given us a calling, a purpose, uh, a ministry that we are to complete. And, and in order to do that, you have supplied the people, the, the, the ministers, to execute those ministries that we are a part of. You have provided the financial resources as well. And so we thank you for all of that. And I pray, God, that we will be found faithful in doing that which you've called us to do. And tonight, Lord, as we look at our prayer list, we recognize that there are many, many needs there. Some are physical, some are spiritual, some are emotional. And so we pray, place each one in your hands and in your care for you to meet their needs according to your, your will and according to your riches and glory. And now, Father, we pray for Pastor Keith as he comes uh, to share from the word. I pray that we will find it encouraging, inspirational, strengthening, and provide instruction in godly living. Draw us closer to you and in the fellowship that we enjoy with you tonight and with one another. May it honor you in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> Okay. I'm still trying to get my back on an even keel. <coughs> when I was coming in to the back doors in here for study, the doors are open, and there's there's a fair amount of traffic back there. Not as much tonight. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people in our church are allergic to rain, and so they they have to at doctor's orders stay home when it's raining. Uh, and so I had shut one side of the door and tried to do it quietly, and then I had the other side, and I was letting it close behind me slowly, and I stuck my hand back to keep it from making a noise. Well, the whole time I'm listening to Clyde and watching, and when I stuck my hand back, it ran into another hand. <laughs> and I was like, And there was a human that materialized from nowhere. 
Ashley. <laughs> okay, Exodus uh, 34. Turn there with me. We're going to read the rest of this chapter. And um, <clears throat> towards last week, I really wanted to focus on, <clears throat> to, to me, this is, this is top three in terms of uh, growing intimate, deep, rich in your fellowship with, with God. Kind of what we see at work here in this passage. And then we'll be through with uh, chapter 34. <clears throat> Maybe make it home before it gets uh, too bad weather-wise. <clears throat> By the way, for those of you who don't know it yet, back there in the back, uh, we now have a 24-7 coffee dispenser. How many of you have seen that back there? And it's just going to be, it's there anytime. Decaf, regular, hot water if you bring a tea bag with you, whatever, it's right there. Um, so on Sunday mornings when you come, that big coffee cart's not going to be out there anymore because this is in here. And um, so help yourself. Miss Lynn's pretty good coffee, isn't it? Okay, we're not going to get out of Bible study <laughs> before the heavy rain gets here, but maybe, maybe we can go ahead and do chapter 35 and it'll be over. And <laughs> all right, Exodus 34. Let's begin up at verse 27. After all that's been going on and God's made a covenant, uh, with the people, and he's warned them about making covenant with, with uh, <clears throat> other people in the land into which he's taken them. And we talked about all that last time. So we're kind of coming to the close of this chapter. And so the Lord said to Moses in verse 27, Write these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you in Israel. Let me just say real quick, we live under not the old covenant. We live under the new covenant now, okay? We're New Testament believers. Our covenant with God has also been written down, just like this old covenant was. And our covenant is written where? Not on tablets of stone. In our hearts and in the Word of God. Everything about what it means to be in relationship with God through Christ is found in Scripture. And I'm just throwing that out there because there's a lot of stuff being taught that is extra scriptural. It's the, there are preachers and teachers of um, the Bible who claim special revelation, who claim that God has shown them things that are not revealed in the Bible, but he has asked them to reveal it to the world. And the Bible is pretty clear about God's thoughts towards anybody who adds to or takes away from the words of scripture. Scripture is authoritative from Genesis to Revelation right here. That, that is our covenant now, the fullness of it. We see the Old Testament, all the shadows of the New Testament that we've been picking up on as we study just even through the book of Exodus. And, and, and then the fulfillment and completion that we see now in the New Testament. So our, our covenant also has been written down. We call it the Word of God. That's why it's so important that we know it, that we study it, that we read it, that we get it into our hearts, that we ingest it, we allow the Holy Spirit to graft it to our soul. So he was there, meaning Moses, he was there <clears throat> with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread uh, nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. This is, this is such a beautiful and amazing picture right here. This physical change in Moses' appearance by virtue of having been in the presence of God for an extended period of time, 40 days, 40 nights. The glory, the glory of God had, had rested on him. He, he was covered in the dust of the glory of Almighty God. And when he came down, it was very evident uh, to the people. Verse 30 tells us, Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. And that's a fairly typical response. If you come, come up on a person who's glowing in a supernatural way, you're going to kind of do what? Maybe go to the other side of the street? Step back? I mean, you know. So it got their attention. 
So let me start making some points here, and then we'll read again. When Moses spent extended uninterrupted time in God's presence, he began to glow. The difference was obvious. And what's interesting is that others observed it before Moses knew it was happening. Now, I want you, I want you, to, I want you to get that. When God starts to glorify himself through us, oftentimes we're not aware that he's doing that. Our, our whole thought is just to walk with God, to walk humbly with him, to develop a relationship with him, to be obedient to him. And we're just, we're just trying to live in the fullness of grace on a daily and regular basis. And what's amazing is that people begin to see, recognize the presence of God in us, even when we don't see it, even when we don't realize it. And oftentimes, somebody who's really growing in the Lord, when somebody comes up and points out, I want, I want to tell you something. I just see God working in your life in such a powerful way. I see the evidence of God in you in this way and in that way. It's almost like, it's almost like, nah, I don't, I don't know about all that. But, you know, yeah, I, I'm glad this happened or that happened or we were able to do this because we're not even aware of it. It's not that we're seeking to be a person whose life is glowing in such a way that it knocks people out. It's that we're just so deeply intimate in that relationship with God, it just bubbles out of us, and we don't even realize it. And so um, I, I want to say to you at the front end here, and then some, some application at, at, the back, at, the, at the back end of this study, <clears throat> God wants to transform you as well. God, God wants others to see his transformation in your life. He, he wants us to be living with him in such intimacy that it is clear to those we're around something's different about him. Something's different about her. I don't, I'm not, it's just, it's just different. It's, it's, a, it's a humility, it's a gracefulness, but it's also a boldness and it's a compassion and it's a love for all people, and it's a kindness, and all these fruits of the Spirit that we're familiar with. God wants to transform us so that these are the things bubbling up out of our lives, and they're clearly evident to the people that are around, our spouse, our children, our coworkers, the people at the rec department. See, here's the thing. You've got to, you've got to be hungry for that kind of relationship. You, you've got to have a desire for that. And if we're honest, we don't always have a desire for that kind of intimacy in our relationship with God. We, we have to admit, I think, sometimes that, you know, we feel pretty good if we make it to church once a week. If we make it twice a week, then great day, we're, we're right next to sainthood. But the intimacy in our relationship with God is way more than church attendance, although church attendance is absolutely a, a necessary and important and a vital part of it. Jesus said over Matthew when he's teaching, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness because what will be the result of that? They'll be filled. A hungering and a thirsting. A hungering and a thirsting. Do we have anybody in this room, and if you're watching online, don't raise your hand because I won't see you, but do we have anybody in this room who when you get hungry, if you don't have food available readily, you move from hungry to hangry in a real quick minute. Anybody in here? Yeah, my wife. Okay, we got. Yeah, we got some there. Boy, my wife wants some. When she gets hangry, I don't mess with her. I don't cut up. I don't pick at her. I just say, "Baby, what do you want to eat?" <laughs> I'll go get it. I'll take you there. I'll cook it. What, whatever. I'll, I'll put an IV in your arm and, and feed you a glucose bag. What is it you need? When she gets hungry, and you know that feeling, even if you don't get hangry, you know that when you're hungry and you can't satisfy that hunger, and, and then you start kind of getting that queasy feeling because that hunger just is kind of gnawing at you, all you can think about is you want something to eat. And it's, it's the same when you're, when you're just, you know, we love to say, I'm dying of thirst. And I think there's probably people around the world that get offended when they hear uh, us here in America say we're dying of thirst, you know, and here we are paying a buck fifty for a bottle of water in a in a store. But 
you, you, that feeling that if I don't get something to drink, I'm parched. I just want something, and we, we get it. There are times when I'm working out in the yard on these really hot, humid days, and I'll come in, and you, know, you sweat out a bottle of water in a hurry when you're out there doing that stuff. And I'll go in, I'll open, we, we buy those 20-ounce 20, 20 bottles of water. I'll open one of those, and I will drink the whole thing in one chug. And my wife is just, she's looking at me going, what? And then I finished, I said, baby, I was thirsty. I was dying of thirst. As you look back on the seasons of your life, can you see any times when you had that kind of hunger and thirst to know more of God, to pursue God, knowing that he's the only thing that can fill a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. I mean, generally speaking, in, in churches across America and in other places around the world, that there, there are people who, who know Jesus is their Savior, but they can't, they can't even read the Bible every day. They want to. They just, they just can't seem to get it done. I'm saying there's a real hunger and a thirst. When we're hungry for something, we're, we're, we're going to find something to eat. We, we're, if we're hungry for the righteousness of God, we, that becomes a priority in our life. And so when we, when we don't have a physical appetite for something, when we don't have a hungering and a thirsting physically, it's, it's typically because we're either sick or we've been snacking on junk food in between meals. In my grandmother's wise words, you're going to ruin your appetite, grandson. And I think sometimes if we're not hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God, I think those two things would apply to us to us. Either one, we're sick, and to be spiritually sick means that you're harboring what in your life? I hear you whispering it. Let's go ahead and say it out loud. Sin, unconfessed, unrepented sin. That, that sickens our spiritual soul. It steals our hunger and our thirst for righteousness. Okay? And if it's not that we're, we're harboring sin or flirting with sin or walking in dis willful disobedience, if that's not it, then it's probably because we're eating a whole bunch of Christian donuts and religious French fries. We're taking in a little gospel music and we're putting a little Christian lingo to our vocabulary and, uh, and, 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 and we kind of think that's what life with Jesus is all about. You know? We reduce our, our following of Christ to a matter of tradition and, and, then, and, 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 and just going through some motions of attending church. And, 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 and then we wonder why we don't hunger for God. We all, we all need extended, uninterrupted time with him. I'm going to say this now. I'm going to say it again in a few minutes. If you were to ask me, Pastor Keith, what are the three things you really drill down on when you're discipling somebody? Okay. I'll tell you that in that top three, one of those is developing the discipline of being in the presence of God every day. Call it a quiet time. Call it personal worship. Call it closet time. You can call it whatever you want to. But learning the discipline of slowing everything down, getting rid of all distractions, and coming into the presence of God and being with him, just being with him. Because just being in the presence of God changes you. Being submitted and surrendered on your knees in the presence of God transforms you in ways you do not even understand. Moses didn't even know what was going on with him until other people noticed it and brought it to his attention. I just shared a password with somebody. Who did I share that with? Uh, you're welcome. I, I just you're just welcome. Okay. In Matthew five fourteen, Jesus says, "You don't have to turn here," but He says, "You're the light of the world." That's me and you. We're we're to be lights. We're the light of the world. A city set up on a hill, you can't hide it. When God's doing the work, when God is shaping you, when God is transforming you, man, it's going to explode out of your life. You can't hide that. 
But pe- do, do, nor, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand so that it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We are to shine. We are to glow. We are to radiate the love of God in our world. Verse 31, let's pick it back up. We're going to pretty much read to the end, and then I'm going to make some application based on what I think is the primacy, the importance, the priority of that discipline of personal worship. Verse 31, but, but Moses called them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and, and to him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until it came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel uh, what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. I'm going to read some. If you want to write down these references or if you want to turn your Bibles, that'd be fine too. I I want us to look into some New Testament things real quick on this idea of being transformed, about the glory of God that lives in us by the Holy Spirit of God, the glory of God making its way out of our heart and into the world around us. In Corinthians, Paul is reminding his readers that the Old Covenant, which was written on stone and which actually brought death because the, the law, Old Testament law couldn't save, that law, that Old Testament law, the being in the presence of God receiving that made Moses' face glorious. How much more glory does the New Covenant, written on believers' hearts in this era marked by Christ's death and resurrection, um, Bring, bring glory to God through the ministry of the Spirit. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians 3, 7. If you turn, or if you want to turn there, you can. Beginning at, at, at verse 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, that's a reference to the, to the Old Covenant, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of his glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory. For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. If, if, if that old covenant and that, that interaction with God and all that was going on brought such a reflection of God's glory, how much more so should the gospel of grace in which we all stand bring glory to God through our lives. As believers were transformed into the image of Christ by the Spirit of God, especially as we look into His Word and allow His Word to seep into our hearts and our souls and our minds. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, okay, if you're still there, 3.17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, we don't have to Christ doesn't have to hide his glory from us. We have been brought into the presence of God because of the righteousness of Christ. It's not something that we fear. We are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. God is supposed to rub off on us more than he rubbed off on Moses, whose glory faded. Listen to me. Listen. Wow, that light is so bright. The glory of that light is so bright. I've had this happen to me several times in my 40 years of ministry. And every time it happens, it's very awkward for me as a pastor. Very, very awkward. But it's also very, very sad to me as a pastor. But I've had it that the experience in the different communities where I've lived, you know, I'll be out. And uh, be in conversation with someone who has maybe, who is not a member of the church that our pastor maybe aren't even uh, a member of any church, but just um, some kind of thing. And, and there have been times when just in, in the course of, of sharing something, I'll say, you know, um, uh, Brother So-and-so, I was talking to him the other day, and, 
and, and he was telling me about so and so and so and so. And the person gets this funny look on their face. And they say, Are you talking about, are you talking about brother so and so and so and so? Is that, is that brother so and so's last name? I said, Yeah. I said, Do you know him? And, and to have that person look at me and say, Yeah, but I never would have guessed he went to church. That is so sad. That, that, it's, 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 it's really sad. regardless of what people think about you, whether they like you, don't like you, agree with you, don't agree with you, wherever we are, people, wherever we are, at the rec field, in Walmart, at Huddle House, wherever we are, those who know us and are around us and even those who maybe don't even know us should be able to see, sense, hear, understand, notice that something about us is different. It doesn't match what's going on in the world. It doesn't fit with what the, the, the accepted norms are. That There is a grace to us. There is a love to us. There is a kindness to us. There is a patience to us. There is a, uh, 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 an eagerness to forgive in us that you just don't see everywhere. Do the people around you that see you at work and at play and... Did, are, they, are they aware you're a follower of Christ? Is it pretty clear to them? I think probably for a lot of us in here, we hopefully we could say yes. But, man, what a challenge. In verse 12 of 2 Corinthians 3, Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. We, we walk in the boldness of the glory of God that lives in us by his Holy Spirit and that bubbles out of us as we walk in ever more intimate, deep, rich fellowship with him. To, to put it another way, when Paul was writing to the Philippian church, he says that as a result of the transforming work of God in us as we more and more spend time in his presence. We're to shine. I love this. Shine like stars in the world. Shine like stars. Philippians 2.12, if you're following along, it's going to read, and I'll give you a second to get there. Okay, here we go. Philippians 2.12. With all these phones we're using now, people, we get there in a hurry. Get there in a hurry. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I, did not, that I did not run in vain or labor in vain in reference to his discipling work among that church. So let me make some application and then we'll go. I think that rain has calmed down a little bit. You cannot look at, you and I, we cannot manufacture the glory of God. I think that's what we try to do sometimes. We try to make ourselves seem more godly. Okay? That, that's, 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 that's called fake. Okay? I don't know how many of you know this or not, but on social media, all these pictures you see of people on social media really aren't exactly how those people look in their natural habitat. Those are all mostly staged pictures. I mean, there's whole t tutorials out there about the best way to pose so that it makes you look slimmer or taller or whatever it is you want to focus on. And there are a lot of Christians living their lives that way. They're presenting in the public a face, but there's a whole private side that does not in any way reflect the glory of God. 
You, you can't manufacture the glory of God. You can only be transformed in it and by it. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit in you. And the, and the primary way of that transformation is in the consistency of being in the presence of God, uninterrupted, no phone, no, oh, but my, my phone is my Bible. I would suggest, I would suggest you get a hard copy Bible for your private worship time. Okay? I would suggest just before you go in to spend time with God, you get in your car. You drive three miles down the road, lay your phone in a ditch, come back to the house, spend time with God, and then go back and get your phone. Well, what if my phone's good? That's a blessing from God. I'm just saying, you've got to really work. Listen to me. You've got to work to develop the discipline of God of stepping away, stepping off of the grid and getting into the glory of God in a quiet place and just spending time in His presence. Conversation, sharing from your heart, but then allowing God to share into your heart, being transformed by His Holy Spirit. I'll give you an example. It's kind of a crude one, okay? The analogy doesn't work exactly, but it works. Anybody here know what a tanning bed is? Yeah? Anybody ever been in one? It's not a sin. Some of you are like, ooh. Okay, we've got one person. That, we've got another one there. Oh, we've got another one here. Yeah. Tanning beds are... Are what? They're what? They're They're interesting. I mean, it's an interesting concept. But the thing about a tanning bed is you, you come into the presence of the tanning bed and you expose yourself to it. You know, you, 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 don't, you don't go into a tanning bed dressed like this. You put your bathing suit on. I would put my bathing suit on. <laughs> I'm not going to go beyond that. I would have my bathing suit on. And you go into the presence of the tanning bed. And basically what you do is you, you, you are just quiet in the presence of the tanning bed. Either the lay down kind or the stand up kind. Okay? You just present yourself there. And just by being there in the presence of that tanning bed, for however, I don't even know, I don't know how long you're supposed to, to do a session in a tanning bed. I understand you start with shorter sessions and then build up as your skin becomes more leathery. And um, <laughs> so, you know, you, you come to the presence. And <clears throat> so when it shuts off, I get, did, did it shut off automatically? Timer or some kind of thing? You know, then, then you come away. And after the first time, especially if you have really, really white skin, first time you come out and, and you'll notice you have a little bit of a lobster look, you know. And, and then that begins to darken up, and then you're back in. And you, you keep coming to the presence of the glory of the tanning bed. And the more you come into the presence of the glory of the tanning bed, as you leave the tanning bed, what becomes more obvious? That you've been in the presence of a tanning bed. You know? It's like 32 degrees outside for the last six months, but you look like you just came from Jamaica. I mean, you know how you did it? Well, that's the glory of the tanning bed showing up in your life. And it's not because of anything you did. It's because you made it a priority to present yourself into the presence of the tanning bed. Use another example. You go to the gym to work out. Some people go to the gym to work out. Some people go to socialize. Some people go to get in a tanning bed. But there are those people who go to seriously work out at a gym. You know, weights, whatever it might be, cardio, and all those things. Okay, let me ask you something. The first time you go in to a, a gym, let's just, let's just use biceps. Okay, that's, that's, that's the uh, show muscle. Okay, everybody wants that muscle right there. You know, they want a big bicep. So let's say you're going in there, and so your first day you go in there, and you just, I mean, you rip off. You, you go through three different curl exercises, you know, working the different, the different heads of the, of the bicep. And, I mean, you go to, to failure and just work it out so that w when you're leaving, your arms feel like they're quivering from the inside out. 
First day. You wake up the next morning, your biceps going to be all that much bigger. <laughs> After one, one session, are you going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger? You know? Uh, no, you're going to be like, what? But if you keep going and presenting yourself to those dumbbells and consistently grasp them and exercise that, you might not notice it right away, but eventually one day somebody's going to come up to you and they're going to make some kind of comment. They're going to say, great, Dad, you got some guns. Well, you've been in the gym. And, and, and then, and then that's, that's where we start having to wrestle with human pride because there's a part of us that goes, yeah, well, yeah. Just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> but the point I want to make, just like with the tanning bed, you, you have to keep going. You have to keep exercising to see that. If you decide you're going to run a marathon and you're not a runner, or maybe you were a runner and you've not been a runner for several years, are you going to go out tomorrow and run 26.2 miles the first time out? No, you're going to go on the Internet and you're going to find training for a, a marathon. I need a program. Would you like a three-month program, six-month program, 12-month? 12-month, please. <laughs> and you might just start out running a minute and walking a minute for two miles. Then for three. Yeah, but, but if you just keep consistently doing it, listen, Prayer time with God, coming into his presence, okay, C coming to worship, okay. Bible study, Bible study is critical to spiritual growth. I want, uh, talking about top three things that, you know, I, I talk to people about how to begin systematically studying your Bible. That is critical. But Bible study is not a substitute for personal worship. It certainly adds to it and deepens it, but it's not a substitute, okay? Worship is when you are just bringing your heart and yourself to God to be exposed to his glory, and you're, 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 you're praising him, you're adoring, you're expressing your love. Confession and repentance are a big part of that. You're, you're interceding when God, the Spirit, puts something on your heart, you're, 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 you're you're laying out the things that are even too deep to put into words, and you're saying, God, I don't even know how to pray. And God, and, and you keep coming back to your love of God, and then you, you finally give up, give out of words, and, and God says, you know, let me talk for a while. And then he begins to bathe you and to wash you in his presence. And, and it's just an incredible thing. And that's when we are being transformed into the glory of God. What happens is if we're substituting deep, deep Bible study for that personal worship transforming time in the presence of God, like Moses up on the mountain, what we turn into is someone who likes to argue about Scripture, but there's no sense of the glory of God in what we're doing. I, I cannot tell you enough. You've heard me say it from the pulpit here. I've been here 15 years. I don't know how many times I've said this. It would be better for you to quit everything you're doing in the church and develop the discipline of being in the presence of God than to keep going in your own strength. And, and sometimes for a lot of us, one of the greatest dangers and one of the greatest obstacles to us developing that discipline of being on the mountain, so to speak, with God, is we're doing so much in the church. But a lot of that's in our own strength because we're not going to the source of strength and just being in his presence to be transformed. So let me put it to you this way. When we, when we make it a priority to be in the presence of God, You've heard me talk about even having a place dedicated to that, to where as you begin to move in that direction, your soul just begins to, 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 to shout with joy because that, that, is, that is the place where you spend those intimate moments with God. When you're on the mountain with God, His, His, His power, His presence, it, it transforms your heart. Number one, it, it's in those transforming times of personal worship when, when we, we begin to grasp the deeper love of God for all of humanity, uh, the agape love of God. We, 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 we begin to allow God to examine our motives for what we do and why we do it. It's, 
uh, our hearts are just exposed before God, and He begins to transform and to work in our hearts in all the ways that He sees that they need to be worked on. Our hearts are transformed. Our minds are transformed by the Word of God, by the Holy Spirit within us, by this discipline of just coming before Him. Our, our attitudes, our prejudices, our, our personal agendas, all these things, our mind, He's just shaping and transforming our mind. Remember now, the first time you go into the presence of a tanning bed, you don't walk away looking like you're from Jamaica. It's consistently doing it over time. The first time you go to work out in a gym, you don't walk away looking buff. It's coming back and coming back and coming back and being quiet and being still. By the way, I'll say this. If you will develop this discipline in your life, if you will, if you will make it a priority, what you'll begin to find is that your time in personal worship will grow and you will begin to say less and less because your heart is learning to just be quiet in the presence of God to rest in the shadow of the Almighty to soak up the glory of who He is and what He's done for you in Jesus Christ being in, in His presence it transforms our heart it transforms our mind it, it transforms our will I will. We are much more submissive in the presence of God and submissive to the purpose of God and the leading of God in our life. Humility grows, grows in us the more time we spend on our knees in the presence of God. Listen, you can't fake humility. Only the Holy Spirit of God can bring that about, can transform your heart, your mind, your will to where your life is displaying that kind of, that kind of, 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 of humble walk with God. Time with God opens the hidden doors of our lives. And I, I'm going to say this. I think that's one reason a lot of us don't get in front of God more often. Because it's those hidden doors we don't want God to go behind. It's the things in those rooms that we've kind of pushed them away and we've gotten over it and not a lot of people know about it and we're still pretty ashamed of it. But, you know, everybody makes mistakes and, and God wants to clean those rooms out. Because I tell you, when something dead is somewhere in your house, even if it's behind a closed door, eventually it's going to what? Smell. Stink. The more time you spend in the presence of God, and he's so gentle when he does it. God is so gentle when he, when he knows there's a locked door that you've hidden stuff behind. He is so gentle in, in inviting you to trust him with whatever you're hiding. To let him in that room to let him bring healing, to let him bring restoration, to let him bring forgiveness, to, to let him bring freedom into your life. You got, you got to be in the presence of God on a regular basis, spending time, precious time. And man, it's transforming. Being in the presence of God, it washes the soul. Confession, repentance, the cleansing of the work of the Holy Spirit as we worship in the presence of God. And I promise you, it's in that place, you and God, His Holy Spirit planted in you, the Word of God that you're hiding in your heart, it's in those personal times of worship that you experience clarity in your life. You see life differently. You see relationships differently because you're looking more and more through the eyes of God. I know it's time to go. So that, that section right there the, is such a beautiful pattern. Moses extended time in the presence of God, and it's so powerful in his life that people recognized it. And then we see our call to be lights in the world so that people see the glory of God in us. And the only place, the only place to begin to experience that kind of overflow is through spending time in worship with your Heavenly Father, just kneeling before Him, letting Him love on you. Do you hunger and thirst for God? 
you're hungry and thirsty enough to build into your life this discipline of setting aside intentional time every day to rest in the presence of God. If not, I would encourage you to do that. Let's stand together and pray. We dismiss. And we'll head out into the big world. Father God, we love you tonight. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us first. And Father, thank you for the faithfulness of your love toward us. Father, thank you that your love for us is not based on our performance, on how good we are or how bad we are. You don't withdraw your love for us when we have a bad day, when we stumble in our faith. Father, your love is constant, full, complete all the time. And I thank you for that. And Father, I, I'm sorry. And, and, and I'm sorry for all, all, all the times in my life the days, the hours, the energy that I've spent trying to pay you back. Trying to pay you back for something I can't pay you back for. Father, teach, teach me, teach all of us what it means to walk in the fullness of your love for us in Jesus Christ. And God, as, as your people that meet on this street corner would you convict us? Would you encourage us? Would you exhort us by your spirit to develop this daily discipline of worship? Just us and you so that you might do your transforming work in us. Heart, soul, mind, body. For the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go out in the storm. Be safe. <laughs>